Good morning, Vernonia Church. <laughs> I want to say welcome to uh, our worship time this morning. I want to say welcome to all of those of who, you who are joining us online as well. Just want to say I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us. Hey, in just a few moments, we're going to begin a, uh, c- or continue actually this message series that we began last week where we're talking about loving God from the heart. And in this series, we're talking about the wisdom of the heart. And we're talking about uh, applying wisdom to our hearts and learning to love with wise hearts. And we're going to have a message in just a few moments where we're going to talk about the desires of the heart. But before we do that, I know we just prayed. I want to invite all of you, all of you online, all of you who are here in person, I want to invite all of you just to pray with me as we, as we jump into God's Word together. We're going to be covering a lot of God's Word today. We're just going to be like going through a bunch of stuff. So, so let's pray and let's ask God to open our hearts, to teach our hearts, to, to put the desires in our hearts that we need to have there. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come before you this morning and worship you and honor you and and come before you and dig into your word. God, I pray that we would come to you with hearts that are ready to let you speak into them. I pray, God, that you will move our hearts, change our hearts, help us grow in our love for you in our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we all said loudly with lots of heart, amen. Well, you guys have a lot of enthusiasm this morning. Uh, So glad to be together with you. I've missed a lot of you. Last week we had our first in-person service, and it was great to see some of you and glad that you've come back. And and now that we're able to have more people all at once, I'm so glad to see all of you who are back here too. And uh, we're going to have a 9.30 service and an 11 o'clock service, so we're going to see people a little bit later too. And it's just good. It's good to give you back in the house of the Lord together and to worship with him. So I'm looking forward to it, but let's dive in right now as we think about the heart. Let's think about this thing that, the, that, that Jesus would say to us. Listen, the most important and the greatest achievement and the greatest command you could ever follow. The, the, if, you don't, if you don't pursue anything in your life, this one thing is the most important thing that you can pursue, and it's to love God with all your heart. It's to pursue God with all of your heart, to make that the thing that your heart goes after. And throughout the Bible, the the use of the word heart will uh, will be a word that will mean more than just that muscle that's inside of you that's pumping blood through your body. It will be used to describe the inner man. It will be used to describe who you are on the inside. And and we could break it up into parts and pieces because we're Westerners and we think that way. But we could talk about how there's the desires of the heart. There's the perspectives of the heart. There's the values of the heart. And together with the desires and perspectives and values, we bring them together. And what comes out of our heart is the things that we say and the things that we do and the behavior that we indulge in. And sometimes what we find is that is that where our hearts, what our hearts are filled with and where our hearts are longing for and wanting to go, that will change the direction of our life. In fact, this has been a truth that we've come back to over and over again, and we will continue to come back to it. And the truth is this, that you and me will continue to every day fulfill the desires of our heart. That every day, everything we do, every action we take will will be a reflection of what we have put in our heart of what we allow to win, what we allow to rise up, what we allow to be a part of what's in our heart. And so this morning, we're going to take one of the pieces of heart, the desires. And we're going to talk about what does the heart desire? What do we allow our heart to desire? What what do we want to fill our heart with? John F. Kennedy used to tell the story of his grandpa Fitzgerald. And he told the story of, of how grandpa Fitzgerald would go walking to school back and forth with his with his friends as as kids they would walk back and forth and they would always walk along this stone wall and they would walk along this stone wall that was intimidating it was tall it was scary they they didn't really know what was on the on the other side and and, and they would always dare each other oh i dare you to climb up and go over the wall 
Well, this went on for quite a while, and, and one day, JFK tells the story about how his grandpa, Fitzgerald, was walking along, and, and finally, someone dared him to go up over the wall, and, and so he took his hat. Now, the hat was important, because in that day in Ireland, they were going to school in uniforms, and the hat was a part of the uniform, and so he took his hat, and he threw it over the wall. He threw that hat over the wall, and, and now he'd committed himself. He wasn't allowed to come home without the hat. He knew that he now had to go over the wall. And, and so we get this phrase, this saying, well, if you really want to do something, if you really want to go after something, throw your hat over the wall. And, and that's where that idea came from. At least that's where w w who's credited with the idea of throwing the hat over the wall. But, but he would throw his hat over the wall. And, and what we're going to talk about as we talk about the desires of the heart is how the heart... And the desires of the heart are a lot like a hat that we throw over the wall. When we have something that we desire in our heart, we're going to accomplish it. We're going to go after it, good or bad. If I get a desire in my heart that I shouldn't have there, and I let that desire grow in my heart, take root in my heart, overcome my heart, I'm probably going to go with that desire. If I have a desire in my heart for God and the things of God, and when the opportunity comes to, to not walk the ways of God, to not listen to the Spirit of God, uh, I'm going to go with God because I let, I let God be the thing that was the desire of my heart. And so what we're going to say is what we put in as the desires of the heart, as we talk about the wisdom of the heart, what we put in as the desires of the heart will end up being a lot like us throwing our hat over the wall. And so we're going to talk about some different walls, some different things that we want to throw our hat over to make sure we fill our hearts with the right desires. We're going to come back to a verse in Ecclesiastes. If you don't know the book of Ecclesiastes, you, you read the book of Ecclesiastes, it could be really confusing. Because what it is, is it's a book of the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, and he wrote this book, and, and he basically pursues all the different avenues that people pursue, and philosophies that people live by in life, and he shows how they're, they're meaningless if they don't include God. But one of the things that he says is this little truth. He says, a man lacks nothing his heart desires. And, and well, on one side, you might say, well, there's a lot of things my heart desires that I don't have. Well, it's because you desired other things more. You know, like I might say, I, I want to love God with all my heart, but if my heart desires to go fishing instead of going to church, and I go fishing instead of going to church, then I have now, I, I have now chosen one over the other, one want over the other, one desire over the other. And, and I know I'm just picking on fishermen because I, I mean I'm a fisherman. I like to go fishing. And, and and by the way, if you're fishing or if you're on your boat fishing while you're watching this, that's okay. But if you're fishing and you're not watching, I'll pray that you don't catch any fish till church is over. <laughs> I do the same thing during hunting season, by the way. But God, God has put, put us together in such a way that when we desire something in our heart, we're going to go after it because we're passionate people. We're passionate about what we want and what we do. So, so let me share with you some things. All these things are going to be somewhat countercultural. They're not things that you're probably going to be told to desire them or fill your heart with a desire for them uh, by too many people. In fact, number one is going to be this, that, that the Bible will teach us to fill our heart with a want for restraint. Now, that almost sounds the opposite of, of want, right? To want restraint, to, to want to hold yourself back. The world's going to tell you, go after everything you want, acquire everything you want, build up and amass a hoard, you know, and, and, and go after the things of your heart. Listen to your heart, follow your heart, and, and the world will tell you to just to just go after whatever is on your heart, whether it be anger and you want to go fulfill your anger and angst and, and you want to want to hurt people in anger, whether you want to uh, fill your life with materialism or alcohol or whatever it is that you want, just go for it and fill up on it. That's what the world will tell you. Then it will condemn you for doing it. That's Satan's little trick. But... What we see in Scripture is a challenge to show restraint. In different places, we'll see wisdom. Now, you'll notice as we talk about the heart and loving God from the heart that this isn't just going to be a touchy-feely series. 
this is going to be a series about applying wisdom to the heart. So we're going to come back to Solomon and his wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, Solomon is teaching his son a lesson that I think all sons should probably learn. So Sammy, if you're listening, listen to this. Uh, it's my son. And so in Proverbs 16, he says to his son, better a patient man. Uh, you could read better a man who shows restraint than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. And it's better to show restraint than to destroy and to let full vent to your anger. In fact, in other places, Solomon will say to us, he will say, listen, uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's better to not give full vent to your anger because a fool gives full vent to his anger. And sometimes you and I probably need to remember that lesson, don't we? Uh, as you're talking to your husband or your wife, as you're talking to your children, don't give full vent to your anger. As you're talking to your pastor, <laughs> as you're talking to your friends, as you're on Facebook, and you're the keyboard warrior going to conquer the world with your anger and your angst, it's better to hold restraint. It's better to not give full vent to your anger. In other places, uh, we'll see people and they give, they, give, they give their heart an unrestrained desire to go after sinful things. We come to this story in 1 Samuel. It's a story about two sons of Eli, the priest at the time. In the Old Testament, this priest was, was the person that people were going to come to for spiritual guidance, to go to God. And he had two sons. Uh, we know them as the sons of Eli. And these guys were incredibly wicked. They were wicked because they were committing adultery and fornication with all the women that came to worship at the church, at the temple. And, and they were wicked because they were intimidating people and, and physically hurting people. And they were stealing from people and from God. When people would bring a sacrifice like a lamb, the way the system was set up was set up in a way so that if, if you and me, if we were going to go to the temple and worship, we'd bring us a, a lamb that was going to be sacrificed on our behalf. And when that lamb was sacrificed, some of the meat would go to me and my family so we could all sit down and have a meal and, and celebrate the, the goodness that God has shown us or, or whatever the forgiveness God is giving us or what, whatever the reason is we were coming to sacrifice. And then some of the sacrifice was to go to the priest and his sons so that, so that they could survive and live off the job that God had given them to do. And then some of it was supposed to go to God, the fat portions. It was supposed to be burned on the altar, it burned all up. And, and so there was God's part, the people's part, and the priest's part. But these two sons, these wicked sons, were coming to people and intimidating them. They were saying, give us all uh, that we want. And so the people who were bringing offerings would say to them, take as much as you want. And there's the desire idea. Take whatever you desire. Uh, take it as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. In other words, take my part, take your part, but don't take God's part. But these guys, they were so wicked in their hearts that it says, then the servant would demand, no, give it to me now, or I'll take it by force. They were doing the shakedown. You know, they were, you picture, I picture these two guys like they're mafia, they're, they're mafiosos at the, at the temple. They're going to take whatever they want. And it's the idea that sometimes we get a desire in our heart and whether we're going to hurt others with it, whether we're going to be held accountable to God with it, we might not even care. But we might get to a place where we, we have a desire in our heart for someone that's not our spouse. And, and that desire grows. And we think, well, I'd never commit adultery, but then that desire, we allow it to stay, and, and instead of showing restraint, we get to a place where it's easy to indulge. We might get to a place where in our heart we would say, well, I would never hurt anybody, but then we get angry and we go out and we hurt people and we give full vent to our anger. We might say, I would never steal from somebody, but then we get wanting something so bad that, that we eventually give in to the temptation instead of showing restraint because we love God. We give full vent 
to whatever it is our heart desires. In Proverbs 23, 1 to 4, uh, the, uh, Solomon was once again teaching his son. He tell, talks to his son about how, you know, sometimes, son, you're going to sit at wealthy people's tables. Sometimes, son, you're going to eat with dignitaries. Because Solomon was a king. He knew that his son would be with him at dinner and, and, at, and at events where they're with wealthy people with wonderful things on the table. And here's what he says. When you sit to dine with a ruler or when you sit to dine with someone who has maybe more than you have or who has something that you don't have that you would like, who has a life that maybe you think their life might be better than yours, when you sit down and dine with that ruler, note what is before you. And then he says, do not crave his delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Don't wear yourself out to try to live the life they're living. Don't, don't want it so bad that you're going to unrestrain yourself and live in a way that you're going to hurt yourself and deny yourself the ability to love God and serve God in order to get what they have. Instead, he says, have the wisdom, and here's the wisdom of the heart, have the wisdom to show restraint. And so maybe we need to say to ourselves, I'm going to, I've never thought about it before. In fact, I'm going to guess that, that most of us in the room have never had someone tell us that if we're going to love God with all our heart, we need to learn to fill our heart with restraint. But here Solomon says to us, fill your hearts with restraint. Have wisdom to have restraint. So number one is fill your heart with restraint. Number two is this, uh, fill your heart with a want for generosity. Fill your heart with a want for generosity. Sometimes we can, we can find ourselves filling our heart with a want for more and more and more and more. We can find ourselves wanting more stuff, more boats, more fishing lures, more hunting gear, more, more mounts on the wall, more fish on the boat, more boats. We, wanna, we want, I keep coming back to fishing. It must be on my mind. I haven't done it in a long time, so uh, it's free fishing weekend. Maybe it's a good time to do that. So, but... But we want more and more and more. And, and, and sometimes Solomon, we're going to see Solomon, he's going to talk about people who want more and more and who crave more and more and who have this craving. We're going to see Solomon talk about that with his son. And sometimes we have the temptation to hear him say what he's going to say. And we're going to think, well, he's talking about lazy people. But the word that he uses, even though we think of lazy people, he's going to talk about people who spend their whole life Craving and wanting and acquiring. Craving and wanting and acquiring. I'm going to crave more. I'm going to want more. I'm going to acquire more. And doesn't that sound like most of us in our life? We crave more, want more, work more for more, so that we can have more, so that we can say we have more, so that we can tell others we have more, so that we can experience more, so that we can, and, and it's just this craving, and Solomon's going to say to his son, listen, people who do that, it's going to be the death of them. They're going to go through all this life, and that's all there is to this life, and they're going to die, and it's all going to go away. I heard a story about a little girl, her mom, and said, mommy, you know that, that china cabinet that you've told us that, uh, you know, it's been passed on from generation to generation and generation. You've told us how valuable that is. And, and mom said, yes. And she's a little concerned. And the little girl said, well, mom, this generation just dropped it. <laughs> and sometimes in a moment, the things that are valuable to us lose all their value. And what God wants us to know is that there's only one thing that lasts. And it's the love for God. There's only one thing that gets to go with us into eternity. And that's our relationship with God. And this God that we know is an incredibly giving and incredibly generous God. He's so giving, so generous, so loving that he died on a cross and gave his life for us. That he could die for us. So that he could give us the very life that he deserved and he earned and he created. And he says to us, I want you to be generous like me. And if we spend our whole life piling into our heart a desire for things and stuff, then we don't leave room in our heart for a desire to be like God and to be generous and to be giving. In Proverbs twenty-one twenty-six, 
he talks uh, Solomon in the very in the verse right before it Solomon describes this person as a sluggard who craves everything he says he's a sluggard that's where we think usually we think of that as lazy but really what he describes the sluggard as is this slug who craves and wants to acquire and it'll be the death of him that's in verse 25 and then in 26 he says all day long the sluggard he craves for more but the righteous give without sparing and so you see Solomon teaches his son that some people, they'll be like slugs that are, are all about acquiring and gaining and gathering, but other people are going to be all about giving. And those are the ones with righteous hearts. Those are the ones that have filled their hearts with generosity. In Ecclesiastes 6.2, it just reminds us, God gives a man wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing that his heart desires. Here again, Solomon's describing a situation that some people will find themselves in, in a place where they just gather, they do whatever their heart desires, but God doesn't enable him to enjoy them. And a stranger enjoys them instead. This generation just dropped to the China, Mom. A stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless and a grievous evil. When people live this life all for the gaining and consumption rather than the giving and generosity that God created us to have in our heart. And so we come to number three. Number three is this, to fill your heart for want with want for righteousness. The word righteousness means that you have a right standing before God. It means that you could stand before him and say, God, it's okay for me to be in your presence. Now, ultimate righteousness, that kind of righteousness, only comes from Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. But after we receive that kind of righteousness, we want to start living a life where we're filling our hearts with desire to be righteous in the way that God wants us to be righteous. Sometimes we can fill our heart with sin and the desire to sin. Now, now as Christians, we're still all going to struggle. We're still going to be people who have this battle between the desire for sin, the desire to do what's right, and the desire for God. And, and, and what this means to fill our hearts with a desire for righteousness is that we get ourselves to a place where we desire God more than we desire those other things. So that we throw our hat over the wall and we say, I'm going to love God instead. I'm going to love God instead of going after the things my heart is craving. I'm going to show restraint. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to look for righteousness. Those are the things I'm going to look for. But Paul will describe his experience with this. He'll say, sin produces in me every kind of covetous desire. He will say, sin in me makes me want things I'm not supposed to have. And how many of you have ever had that experience? You you want things you're not supposed to. Everybody should be raising your hands because, or you just want to lie, and so your hand's not up. But, but sin produces in us a desire to have things that we're not supposed to have. Sometimes it's, it's a person we're not supposed to have, or a position we're not supposed to have, or, a, or, or an item that we're not supposed to have. But we do everything we can to get what we want. We go into all kinds of debt to get things that we can't afford. We, we, we step across the line and, and we, 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 we compromise our values in order to accomplish things or do things that we want to accomplish or do or have. And, and we want to indulge in things we're not supposed to indulge in. So Paul says, listen, sin produces in us this covetous desire, a desire for the things that we shouldn't desire. And in Galatians 5, he talks about that battle. He says the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. And what he's describing there is a heart that's in struggle with itself. Because in one side, we allow one idea, one thing, the sinful nature, to take root in the heart. On the other side, we're saying that we want the spirit to have root in our heart. And, and whichever one has more want in it, guess what? That's the one you're going to go with. And, and so the challenge here is which one are you feeding? Which one are you practicing more in your heart? Which one are you allowing to win in your heart? In Isaiah 26, the prophet Isaiah says, My soul yearns for you in the night. And in the morning, my spirit longs for you. 
when your judgment comes upon the earth, the people of the world will learn righteousness. And, and we need to get to a place where we long for God, we desire God, we want Him in our life, and we want to put out the things that get in the way of our relationship with Him. And, and we get to a place where that's where our spirit is. I mean, a lot of us, I'm guessing, a lot of us have looked forward to being in person at church. We have longed for it, right? For 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 months now, we've longed to be together. We've longed for this time of worship. But what we're seeing Isaiah say here is that this ought to be a place that our heart always is. We always long for God. We always long to be in His presence. And we long for Him. And, and we desire Him. And we're thirsty and hungry. What did Jesus say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. There's this desire, this want in them. That they want Him. And they want His righteousness. Well, I want to share with you, I know you feel like, well, that's three points, the sermon ought to be over. I got seven more. And I'm not even kidding, but I'm going to give them to you quick. Uh, I want to share with you seven things that the Bible teaches us, seven things that, 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 that we could put into our heart that will help us pursue righteousness in our hearts. Uh, went through the New Testament, and throughout the New Testament, we see these, these things where we're challenged to want something, to desire something. And so I want to share with you seven ideas, seven things that, that Jesus wants us to desire. And the first one is this. He wants us to desire mercy. What a message for a time like today. What a message for a time in, in a place where we live, where people are not interested in mercy People are interested in judgment and justice and people are interested in vengeance and people are interested in selfishness and people are interested in pride and, and people are interested in self-serving. And, and, and Jesus said, I want you to go learn what this means. I desire mercy. That's just what I want. I want you to know the mercy of God in your life. And I want you to show the mercy of God in your life. So go and learn what this means, he says to us. I desire mercy. I'm not going to tell you what it means right now. But go and learn what it means. That's what Jesus said anyway, so I'm going to say it. But go learn what it means. Go home and think about it. What's that mean? Jesus said, I desire mercy. How do I show mercy? How do I apply mercy to my life? How do I, what does it mean? To show mercy. Because Jesus desires mercy. By the way, he said that more than once. He said that on, on, on a few occasions. He probably said it more than what we're even told that he said it. But he would say it. He would say, I desire mercy. Sometimes he would back it up by saying, I desire mercy more than I desire sacrifice. I desire mercy more than I desire. And he would say, I desire mercy. So that's number one. Learn how to desire mercy. Put the desire for mercy in your heart. If, if it ever comes down to this, am I going to show grace or am I going to show justice? Am I going to show mercy or am I going to show righteousness or, or, or show judgment? Which one should win? Jesus said, go learn what this means. I desire mercy. Let's move on. Number two, desire love. The greatest of these is love. Those were the words of the Apostle Paul when he talked about all the wonderful things a person could have, great faith, uh, great, great abilities to serve God, great, great, uh, great spiritual gifts. But he would say the greatest thing you can do is love. And remember, Jesus said, the greatest accomplishment you could ever accomplish, the greatest commandment that I've ever given is this, to love God with all your heart. So fill your heart with love. Last week we talked about a prayer. God, help me know how to love you. Help me know what it's like to love you. Help me love you more. If we start praying that prayer on a regular basis, we, we will start to fill our heart with the love for God. And if we really can truly can fill our heart with the love for God, that will go a long way to healing the world we live in. Because your love for God will translate from your heart into behavior that shows love for other people, that shows love for the world around you. And love, 
it says in Scripture, conquers all. Desire goodness. We want to fill our heart with a desire for goodness. A desire to do the good. A desire to fill our life with good. To, 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 to do the, the good things that God wants us to do. We desire goodness. And in Romans 7, 18, the Apostle Paul said, I have the desire to do what is good. I have that in me. I, I desire to do what is good. I want to do it. So we're talking about desire, right? And, and I fill my heart with a desire to do what's good. To have goodness in my heart. Now, at the same time, the Apostle Paul said, and you know what, but I don't always do what I desire. And the reason that is, is because there are times where what I desire, I desire more than what's good. The sin in me. But we ought to get to this place where we're fighting this battle in our hearts to say, I desire to do what is good. Because if I desire to do what is good, then when the opportunity to do what's bad comes up, if I want to do good more than I want to do that, then that's going to win the day. So I fill my heart with a desire to do what's good. Number four is I desire honor. In Hebrews 13, 18, it says desire to live in an honorable way. To desire, sorry, desire to live honorably in every way. I have this desire to live honorably. Now, the word honorably, is, and what he's talking about there, is live in a way that people don't have anything to say. Now, we live in close quarters in Verdonia, and we all have something to say about each other. Because we all know something about each other, probably more than in other places. We, we know a lot about each other, but we ought to be trying to live in a way that's honorable so that people outside the community don't look at our, the church and the people in the church and go, this doesn't compute. They, they love God, sing to God, worship God, go to church, listen to sermons about God, but then they go out into the community and they live dishonorably. And so what it says here is put the desire in you to live honorably. To live in an honorable way. And that's where, that's where we need to be. We have to start filling our heart with a desire to live honorably. The next one is this. Desire spiritual gifts. And along with that desire is the desire to use them to honor God. In Scripture, it says that God gives us, when we come to Christ, He gives us all something, some abilities. He takes a talent we have. He takes something that, that, that He's given each of us, and He wants to use it for His glory and for His kingdom. And, and, and we need to get to a place where we desire to use those gifts for His glory and His kingdom. And, you know, we've had throughout this, this time, uh, there, there have been people who have been indispensable to worship. Someone like Steve right now who's up there working with all the stuff online, who's been making sure we had camera work, who made sure we had all the technology we needed, who, who made sure that we had the ability to worship online rather than in person. And I told Steve, I said, Steve, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have had church for three months. Because I don't know this stuff. God gave him the, the ability and the desire and the want to serve, and, and he found a way to apply that to what he was doing. And he was able to use that. Dan, with the sound system, and all the tech people became very important for the last few months. And, and we, we think of all the people who had something to do. And, and now we're, we're having worship service. And one of the reasons we're able to have worship service and have it online is because Matthew, uh, back here, has done construction back there and built us a worship uh, a video room and a place where the camera could be. It did all kinds of work, and he's using his gifts to honor God, which are which are construction or, or electrician. I mean, he ran wires. It would have taken me like five weeks to figure out how to do it, and, and he did it, and, and God used him. So we desire to be used by God. We desire to take what God has given us and, 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 and serve in uh, use our spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. The next one is this, desire evangelism. We need to put in our hearts a desire to see people come to Christ. That needs to be a desire that just wells up within us. It needs to be a boiling desire, to be honest with you. It, it needs to be a desire where we look at the people in our community and we realize that heaven and hell are in the balance and we desire to see people saved. 
in Romans 10, 1. It says, my heart's desire and prayer is that they may be saved. The Apostle Paul was talking about the Jewish people. He was talking about, about his people. He was talking about his neighbors and friends and the people that he grew up with. And when we think about the people in our community, the people we care about, the desire of our hearts needs to be that we might be able to see them saved. And so we build up a desire in our hearts to see people saved. Number seven is this, desire Christ. Philippians 1.23, the Apostle Paul says, I desire to be with Christ. Now, morbid thought. He's talking about going to heaven. <laughs> he's talking about being with Christ. Not morbid. It's not morbid. What I mean, though, is he's talking about death. He's desiring to be with Jesus. He says, in this life, I'm going to honor God, and I'm going to serve God, and I desire to be with Christ. But but here's a thought, that we ought to get to a place where we desire to be with Christ so that we serve Christ now and we look forward to the day when we get to be with him in eternity. Some Christians, for some reason, practice not wanting to be with Christ now, thinking they're going to want to be with him later. They don't want to listen to Christ, don't want to hear from Christ, don't want to serve Christ, don't want to worship Christ. They, they want to do what they want to do, and they think for some reason they're going to want Christ later. But the Apostle Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me right now in this life, it's all about Christ. I desire Christ, but Christ is in my heart. Christ is who I'm serving. Christ is why I'm living. Christ is my every day. I desire Christ. And so then, when the day comes, I get to be with Christ. Bonus! That's the way we ought to fill our heart. And so as we talk about filling our heart, we, we want to fill it with a desire for righteousness. You know, Grandpa Fitzgerald, he talked about throwing the old hat over the wall. And maybe for some of you, if you take notes today, you had some things that were like walls to you. They were intimidating. They were different. You'd never really thought about them. And my challenge, my dare to you, is to throw the hat of your heart over a wall. Maybe it's one of the seven we talked about. You said, I've never put that in my heart. Your to-do this week is to say, I'm going to throw my hat over that wall and make that my next step. JFK, as president, he learned his lesson from Grandpa Fitzgerald. You may remember the old speech that he gave. He said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard, because that goal will serve to organize and, and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge will be one that we are willing to accept, one that we are unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win. You know, he kind of threw his hat over the wall of the space race. He got up in front of a country and said, we're going to put a man on the moon in 10 years. And in less than 10 years, in 1969, I believe it was, the first footprint was put on the moon. And that event changed the world as we know it. Because of that event, we live in a modern society with cell phones, with, with satellites, with, with all kinds of uh, things in space that, that make it so we, things we take for granted as part of life because of that event. Because someone said, I'm going to, I'm going to take and I'm going to throw my hat over a wall. And what I wonder is what changes in your world? What changes when you say, I'm going to fill my heart with a desire for Christ? I'm going to fill my heart with desires that help me love God with all my heart. What will change in your world? What will change in your family? What will change in your life? What will change in your family tree? What will change in your community? Because you decide to throw your hat over the wall. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we ask that you will help us throw our hat over the wall in a way that challenges us that we say out loud, that we make a decision to love you more. To really make the desires of our heart, desires that seek after you, that go after you, that honor you and love you. God, I want to love you more.
Will you help me know what that means? Will you help me figure out how to make my desire for you greater than my desire for the world or my desire for anything else? I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help each one of us to say we love you with all our heart. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, right now, I want to invite you to join me. We're going to enter into a time of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we're not going to be passing trays until for the next, actually, for the next 21 days. We're in this situation. This is what worship is. And uh, you, you had the opportunity to pick up your Lord's uh, Supper kits on your way in. If you're at home and you're just joining us and you don't have a Lord's Supper kit, you didn't pick it up this weekend, just grab a cracker, some bread, some juice, and you can join us in, uh, in our Lord's Supper time. But we're going to enter into this Lord's Supper time, so I want everybody to grab your little, uh, little kit here and go ahead and peel the top off and take the bread out. And this is something that we as a church do every week together. Don't eat it yet, we'll all eat it together. So as a church, every week, we have even continued, as we've been meeting together digitally, we've continued to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We do this so that we can remember that, that Jesus is the reason that we're together, that his love for us, as we talk about loving him, we talk about making him the desire of our hearts, we remember that, that we love him because he first loved us. We talk about putting him as the desire of our hearts because God describes to us how we are the desire of him. He longs for you, desires for you. He has a desire in his heart for you that is so big that he went to a cross and sacrificed his life to draw you in by his love. And so that's what we do now is we remember what he did for us. Jesus took bread and he broke it. So I always encourage everybody to break the little wafer just because it's a reminder of the way that he broke. Uh, he said, this is my body that's broken for you. And so we'll take it and everybody, let's just eat it together. And we'll say a little prayer of thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the body and the, the life that you gave for us. We thank you for making us the desire of your heart. Even though, God, we know we don't deserve it. Even though we know we have turned from you. And, and, God, we've sought other things with our heart. You have loved us unwavering. You loved us so much you gave your life for us. Even before we chose you. And, God, for that we're grateful and thankful. In Jesus' name. So now we'll take the juice and we'll open that up. And this represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. He said, do this in remembrance of me. This is the blood of the new covenant. The uh, word covenant is a word for relationship. This is the blood of the new relationship that I'm offering to have with you. And by this blood, I will forgive you your sins, wipe away your sins, cleanse your sins. And, and, and it's kind of a strange thought to think about blood cleaning anything. But he describes the way that when his blood cleanses us, it makes us white as snow. Our dark and sinful hearts are cleansed and clean, which allow us to come before him and love him and stand before him and have righteousness in Jesus' name. And so right now, I'd like to invite you to drink it with me, and we'll remember the blood that he shed on the cross, and then we'll say a little prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood you shed on the cross to give us salvation and forgiveness of sins. God, right now we confess to you the sin that sometimes gets in the way of our love for you. And God, we ask you to forgive us, and we know that when we do, that you have promised us that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just and will forgive us. And so we come before you, Jesus, and we just thank you for the blood that gives us grace and gives us forgiveness and gives us love. In Jesus' name, we all prayed and said, amen. Well, I want to say thank you for joining me as we went through our, our message and worshiped in message and we worshiped through the Lord's Supper. And right now we're going to enter into a time where we're going to worship through giving. And so everybody's clapping.
And we clap because it's an opportunity to continue to worship God not in, in every way. I mean, we talked about how we want to fill our heart with generosity and with giving. And one of the ways we do that is by giving back to God what he has given to us. He's been so good to us. He's given us his son. He's been so good to us. He gave us the ability to have our jobs, to work. He, he gave us the opportunity to be able to work and he gave us he gave us everything we have and so we give something back to him to say to him god we honor you with the first fruits of what you've given us and so if you came this morning and you're prepared to give you have envelopes in your programs and we're not going to send buckets around uh we're going to instead there's a little box that uh, actually jack used his spiritual gift of handyman and fix those boxes up for us at one time and so we'll give jack a little hand uh and and so you can drop those envelopes in the box as you go by. Another way that you can give is you can go online at any time to www.vernonia.church. Now, I'm going to spell it for all those who are joining us online because we know, you know, I mean, I have people, oh, you live in Veronica. No, that's, I don't live in Veronica or, okay, so it's V-E-R-N-O-N-I-A uh, dot church. And so you can go to vernonia.church at any time and, there's a give tab there, and you can go to that, and it'll bring you out to our Tithely account where you can give, and it's a secure way to give. Another way you can give, and I encourage all of you who can or want to to do it this way, those of you who are online who are continuing to do it this way, you can text GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 503-376-6646. That's G-I-V-E, to 503-376-6646. Four, six. Eventually, I'm going to memorize that number, but I still haven't, if you can believe it or not. Uh, but I just want to invite you, let's pray as we give, and let's just honor God with what we do right now. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being good to us. We thank you that we can worship you, uh, not just by, by, by singing and not just by listening to a message, but by giving something to you. Because, God, it makes a difference. We have this church after three months of not being here in person because people gave and we were able to continue. Now we're in a strong place to continue to bring honor and glory to you and, and to watch not just, uh, not just people come back to a church that, that they considered theirs, but God so that we can continue to grow and reach new people through this church. And God, I pray that you will use what we do now to bring honor and glory to you so that we can be generous with you and with our community and with our church body. It's in Jesus' name we all prayed and said, Amen. So I want to invite you to come back next week. Next week, same bat time, same bat place. I don't know if any of you old Batman fans remember that. But, uh, but we're going to continue this series where we're going to talk about the perspectives of our hearts. So we talked about the desires. We talked about what comes from the heart. And now we're going to talk about perspectives next week. So be sure to come back. One last final thing, I want you, no matter where you're at, to stand up, please. And we're all going to say, it's been a great day at the count of three. One, two, three, it's been a great day. Have a great day. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention, if you can, I mean, you're welcome to keep your, your high five hands, but if you don't want to keep them, put them back in the bucket. People next service can use them. We're going to wipe them down and, uh, and all that, so... Have a great day. Like when I walk.